right, so here we are for uh, the closing conversation. So maybe less than a panel and more of a, of a sort of concluding, uh, hopefully thoughtful uh, conversation about what's been going on this afternoon. And with me, I have uh, prior highlights from the day, Roberto Verganti, professor and, and center director at SSC, Sarah Jack, also professor at SSC, as well as a new guest, Lars Stranagord, the president of SSC. Great to have you with us. Great to be here. Great. And I'm, I'm hoping and thinking that we might have Annabelle online as well with us. Is that right? That is Great. Awesome. Wonderful to have you with us, Annabelle. And uh, uh, you already kicked off a lot of in really, really interesting topics earlier today. And um, uh, I, I made a, a feeble attempt of summarizing the afternoon just now. Um, I think, you know, since we just had a little bit of a summary, I won't do another summary. I think we should get going. And um, one of the things that I'm interested in to hear more of is, um, you know, I talked just now about how we can create viable scenarios or ideas for how we can shape the future with technology. And I, I'm curious about what, you know, how should we think about o organizations and our life in organizations if we think a little bit forward from where, where we are right now? And, and acknowledging that there's a lot of uncertainty. Roberto, what do you think? Would you like to start? Now the, the reflection that, that uh, emerged and I connected to what happened before in the session on creativity is that probably as technologies expand the possibility the expansion is is in reality is, is a kind of polarization because you give possibilities to do more things mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there was an artist who was really saying that how deliberately mm -hmm. stretches the stream from super fast to super slow and, and or super close and super far uh, and and this is a society in which polarization can be a potential but is also a danger uh, and, and so I think that this is an interesting implication for the mindset that organizations need. There how do you, do you handle polarization and how do we have a reflective mind? Because the only way to handle polarization is to reflect and move beyond. Mm. So, so uh, following on exactly from that, I, we have an audience question from, from earlier, from, um, which has to do with how we maintain or, re or recreate creativity in a world where we interact through digital means. So, you know, how, how do you see that? Um, the, the fact that we are doing a lot of things faster, but we are also doing things perhaps more instrumentally and uh, less visually, for example? But f maybe the, 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 the bottom line is that we need to do a kind of double loop learning, so we need to recreate the way we create. So it's a moment which need, we need to be creative about the creative process, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, for us scholars, is, is, is an exciting moment. And for those out there, it's a very moment of high experimentation. Yeah. Great. So let me see if I can connect that to another topic that I, uh, um, that I brought up with um, uh, Katerina just now, namely, you know, if we take what you're saying right now, we put that in the context of higher education. So, you know, that's, that's part of George, your job, Lars, isn't it? I heard the word higher education, and <laughs> I think that's sort of relevant to me, even though we have <laughs> representatives from that sector too. So, you know, uh, w how should we understand what will happen or could happen to higher education in, in the type of context and uh, situation we are in now? Well, in a sense, uh, I think so much has already happened uh, now, and I think the, uh, I mean, with the rise of, uh, of digital technologies and, and uh, AI and machine learning and all that, many universities have to really sort of revisit the very idea of what they are doing. Uh, what is sort of the business uh, of being a higher education institution? Because the fact is that if we continue to educate the same way as we've been doing the latest uh, decades or so, uh, then our, our, our graduates are gonna go right into irrelevance basically and unemployment even because you know uh, it's actually true that the robots and the machines are taking over uh, so many of the jobs or the jobs are actually transforming into something very different so uh, i think it's necessary to really go into sort of the dna of the uh, uh, of the institution when you where you're at and ask yourself uh, what shall we do uh, what is our position 
and I think the pandemic has really triggered this too, because uh, you know basically all universities. This is a good example uh, today that we've turned into. To uh, you know, we have elements of being media production companies nowadays, and you have to basically do that. But I think it's uh, it's important to to uh, sort of again revisit. And what we've done at SSE is to say, all right, so uh, what? How do we prepare our students for the future in this digital and hybridized uh, or, or hybrid world? Uh, and we have come up with this abbreviation called FREE, right, uh, which stands for fact and science-based mindset, more important than ever, especially in this world of, uh, uh, of digital technologies, where we have you know, Cambridge Analytica and fake news and all that coming through the social media. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to, to really understand what counts as knowledge and wh where knowledge comes from. Mm -hmm. And then reflection, as Robert was talking about, uh, you have to be reflective, understand your own role and, and, and your own position in all this. Uh, and then empathy is something that is, you know, becomes a much more of an uh, important aspect mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of higher education because that's something that the machines still are quite bad at. Uh, I mean, the very essence of being human, understanding others, seeing the world from, their, uh, from others' perspectives is becoming increasingly important. And then being entrepreneurial and creative, etc. Uh, and that's what the final E stands for. So trying to, to, to figure out how do you use the digital means uh, and how do you use sort of the, the, uh, the physical premises in a way that sort of uh, makes the most out of this. Uh, I think that's uh, what we need to do. And just to continue a bit on these abbreviations, uh, I think it's of, of what, what we have been doing now is to say, all right, Let's just be clear that, that um, higher education is not only about content, it's also about all these other things, you know, putting right. the, the content into context, uh, creating contacts, making it being part of a community, etc. Yes. Uh, and then really going through this list and saying, how do we create as much, uh, uh, you know, content through the, through th uh, through the digital means mm -hmm. or, the digi or the technologies that we have? And then how do we make our premises as sort of inspiring and creative as possible? And how do we sort of make uh, in every single aspect of, of education, how do you maximize the sort of C content digitally and physically? And I think that's sort of a uh, homework that we all need to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Lars. That's very interesting. And it, it sort of um, also a little bit implicitly connects to Makoto Fujimura's uh, um, uh, ideas about the importance of the tactile, the, the embodied understanding and knowledge exactly. as well. So we can't make do without that. But uh, Lars, you also point to um, uh, you also point to um, uh, community and responsibility. And and I'd like to turn to um, Annabelle uh, because you you gave us a little bit of hope earlier, a Annabelle, that platforms are not necessarily sort of. Um, uh, um, the consequences of platforms are not um, uniform, inevitable, and and clear for us. There are there are things we can do, and you mentioned regulation as an important thing. Um, what I'm wondering a little bit about is, um, and and to start with something that I'm sure many people do is, um, you know, whenever you visit a website, you you get the question if you accept the cookies, and then you have to before because otherwise you can't use the website and. I'm I'm kind of thinking should I ask the sh should I say thank you to the European Parliament every time I click <laughs> okay on the cookie uh on the cookie question so w what I'm thinking here is yes we can regulate but how can we create the capability to regulate meaningfully um I don't know if you have a, a secret secret solution to that, but I'm curious to hear how you how you think about our abilities to regulate technology that is very fast moving. Yes, I think there's been a great learning curve by a regulator, regulatory agencies, uh, the European Commission, the Parliament. I have been uh, working as an expert uh, for three years between 2018 and 2021 as an expert member of the Observatory of the Online Platform Economy. And in, in, in that year, uh, in that period, I have seen an enormous amount of learning being happening uh, by, uh, by regulators, and, uh, and, uh, and that's very <laughs> encouraging. So the, the, the situation you described about only having a choice to agree or to consent 
mm -hmm. uh, in a yes or no manner. And then if you say no, you don't get access to the content. And you will have noticed that actually this has changed recently. Yes. And that's because of regulation. And yes. now you have a choice yeah. as to which cookies you agree to or you don't agree. Yeah. And and that it will not be possible anymore to offer just a black and white 100% yes or 100% no. And then if it's no, you don't have access to it. Yeah. So I think yeah, the regulation is going in the in the in the right direction, uh, uh, and uh, there is plenty of lobbying out there from big tech companies to make sure that the regulation doesn't go overboard. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, that, that, that that's that's a good thing going forward. As, in addition to regulation, I also believe that uh, uh, market forces uh, are are very vibrant, and mm -hmm. that there is actually something called dynamic competition. So you see, you're going to see new firms uh, that are going to try to make a go of being the next digital providers and next platforms, uh, focusing on the fact that there is an untapped demand uh, uh, of uh, trustworthy digital services. Right. So I think uh, what we have seen over the last few years is a big deficit of trust mm -hmm. uh, because some of the big actors have not deserved our trust. And therefore, that has now been revealed, and therefore there is uh, there is a more salient need for uh, for a different kind of offering. And I think that the combination of increased regulation and market forces is going to generate those those opportunities. That's interesting. So in a way, you could, you you know one way to reframe what you're saying potentially would be to say that. You know the the ultimate platform, namely the internet, uh, may be what enables us to to uh, what enables other platforms with more trustworthy uh, ways of operating to emerge in the future. Absolutely, and I think that will be necessary if we want collectively to preserve this uh, precious resource, which is mm -hmm. an internet that we can trust. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. So, so uh, speaking of, of uh, trust, one another thing we've had uh, we've discussed today is is um, cross sector collaboration and uh, you know the need to um, channel a lot of the resources, energy, and creativeness towards solving social problems. And and that was certainly the theme of of the panel that you led earlier together with our colleague Roxana Tuteria. So what I'm wondering is now at the end of the day here, Sarah, if you have any thoughts on specifically on on the sort of intersection of social entrepreneurship and and, um, and digital technologies, uh, or if there's any other aspect of social entrepreneurship uh, that, uh, that sort of stands out for you from this afternoon. Yeah, I think you've picked up on the kind of inclusivity and I think that's what hy hybridity and di digitalization really kind of offers the opportunity for here is inclusivity. And I think Lars has picked up on that as well when he talks about free and what we do at SSE. Uh, and certainly when I think about the students now, I think that they are much more aware of societal issues and societal problems. So for social entrepreneurship and social innovation, I think that offers uh, opportunities uh, especially in terms of taking things to people, which they can do much more now through mm. digitalization, and yeah. connecting people with people, uh, people and places, which I think is very important. You know, dealing with societal challenges such as poverty, and taking things to 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 the ground level, I suppose as well. And I think digitalization offers opportunities to also take things that are happening in local places and export them to the world. Mm -hmm. So we can see more how people in local areas are tackling uh, societal challenges as well yeah. and learn from them. And I think there's examples going on across the world which have been really good that we can you know, draw, draw on there. And Caroline, uh, Caroline was talking as well about some examples when she spoke and opened the, the conversation this morning, which I thought was particularly interesting as well. Yeah. Uh, but I, th I think as well what's come through for me today when I think about you know, social innovation, social entrepreneurship, is that these things are no longer being perceived as somebody else's problem or somebody else's responsibility, and that we all have a role to play. And I think that that is, is really quite critical. Mm -hmm. I'd just Thank like you. to add to that. I Please. think it's, uh, it's, uh, 
it's very, very clear uh, when you listen to the young students now, the ones who are uh, starting out in the new programs. They are incredibly interested in making a difference. Yeah. They speak about impact. They want to do something meaningful with their lives. And I think that's a huge shift just the latest three, four, five years. Yes. So it's, it's, uh, it's really hopeful. Yeah. Great. And, and we have tools for sharing local solutions that can be redeployed elsewhere. But that is also very, um, it seems very straightforward, right? If you solve the problem once, you shouldn't have to solve it again. But it's not as straightforward to make ideas and solutions travel. And I, I, I know you, Roberto, you've been, you've been thinking a lot about, you know, that we are, we are not in lack of ideas or even solutions probably, but the question is how do we actually get them to, on the ground so to speak, how do we get them to stick where they need to stick? Yes, uh, and uh, and even before that, how do we make sense of this wealth yes. of opportunities that we have in front of us? It's definitely is a phase in the history of the world where, uh, I mean, the most of the theories of management uh, are built about you know building knowledge and information, which is exactly we what we don't miss in this moment. Right. We don't miss knowledge. We don't miss information. We miss the capability of making sense of it. And uh, that's the totally different level of of, uh, mm -hmm. of capability that we need to develop is is a sh completely 180 degree shift from uh, from the theories that we have been developing in many fields in organization innovation always we started from the assumption that managing means communicating building knowledge it's not like this anymore so what is it like <laughs> uh, maybe it's about cleaning a little bit <laughs> <laughs> Curating, uh, maybe curating, yeah. and and uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, and you know, be cleaning the space. Uh, it's uh, we are not used to to do less. Yeah. Yeah. We are always used to add more. And that is right. So do it's less. Like the garbage can metaphor, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, where you have solutions and problems that you throw into a bin, uh, and then you need basically it's just when you say uh, that we need cleaning. You know, that's where you need garbage cans, which means uh, in this instance, uh, uh, actually places where these things come together. Yeah. And also, you know, thinking less is something that has to do with organizational complexity, right? Because usually when we solve problems in organizations, we use we we do that by adding something, right? So th obviously there there are lots of studies that say that organizational complexity is skyrocketing. Um, so okay, so doing less is uh, is something we well should clarity, consider. Clarity, you know. Clarity. I just want to check if if um, so. Annabelle, did you have something you wanted to chime in with there? No, no, not particularly on this topic. Okay, so I'll, I'll throw you uh, I'll, I'll throw you another topic, Annabelle, because you know you got sort of the S the the homespun SSC version of of the role of higher education, but I'm I'm equally curious to hear your thoughts on on this, and perhaps in particular, you know what should there's also actually the question of what should everyone, at least everyone attending university, or at least everyone attending a university in order to have a career as a manager, what should they know about uh, platforms and digital technologies? So uh, first of all, I, I, uh, I completely agreed with the points that uh, Lars was making about universities having to uh, reflect profoundly on what it is that they are here to do and how they can do it better. Um, and uh, Lars was talking about a combination of content which is delivered uh, digitally and taking advantage of uh, physical uh, uh, places and, 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 and resources where people can convene and can uh, build a sense of community. So I fully agree with that. I also think that you know we need to do a lot better in terms of lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. We are really in the middle of a transition, which is going to be a huge transition. I often say that this digital revolution is going to be as big in magnitude as the industrial revolution. So for the next, uh, not just a couple of years, but I think we have at least one or two decades ahead of us, where there's going to be a lot of disruption economic disruption, career disruption, social disruption. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I believe the mission of the university is going to try to help um, upskill and update uh, the competencies of a lot of individuals, not just young, uh, uh, just young individuals. So there is this whole aspect of lifelong learning. Right. And I think, sorry, uh, Please, no, no. go ahead. I really think that um, uh, the, the concept of lifelong learning is something that could actually come much more naturally because it's, it's uh, you know, especially in the European context, you go into university, you get your degree and then you're out. But the fact is that if, uh, you know, lifelong learning to me is really about, a, it's, it's about a mindset. Uh, it's where you go into a mode where you say, I am going into a learning mode or into a shaping mode or into a bildning, as it's called in Swedish, or bildung in, in, in German, mm -hmm. where you uh, sort of open up yourself and say, all right, the, the, the models and the theories that I am now being exposed to uh, during my university years, they will be obsolete. They will not function as well as they uh, are doing now in the future. Mm -hmm. So thereby, it's, it's much more of uh, speaking about mindsets than it is actually about speaking about knowledge in itself and, and sort of really getting in, shifting the way you view the world. Mm -hmm. And if you do yeah. that, then that is what lifelong learning is actually all about. And it, um, once, once, you, once, university, um, uh, once universities actually get that, then uh, the entire role of what they're doing will change, as I see it. Another point Terrific. I want to add to Please. this is that, um, you know, universities cannot just be content production provider and distribution platforms. You know, we, we, we cannot just be a specialized version of YouTube. Right. Uh, and I think that there's something that we as educators know about the process of learning, which is within the context of a, of, a, of a trusting relationship between a student and a, and, a, and, a, and a professor or a student and a and a faculty member it is not about absorbing knowledge just like you upload uh, data on a on a, on a drive mm -hmm. it is about being transformed uh, in a, in a relationship and 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 making sense of knowledge so the point that Lars was uh, discussing earlier, again, I, yep. uh, I agree with wholeheartedly about developing, uh, you know, a critical mind, uh, about developing as a person. And these are things that cannot just happen because you watch videos, however glossy and well produced they are. So I think that universities, those who will uh, survive and thrive in this yep. transition, uh, because it's also a competitive um, uh, industry. Yes. They will be able to redefine uh, the value that they offer to the participants who entrust them uh, with uh, with being uh, with opening themselves up to not just new knowledge and new skills, but but uh, learning how to how to uh, to have a critical mind and learning to have uh, uh, to to be able to express opinions in a respectful way, even in the context of disagreement. And so these things can be done. In, uh, in universities. Yeah, one way, I, I think you put it uh, uh, really excellently, but, uh, uh, or and, uh, a way of phrasing this is that, as I see it, universities should provide uh, knowledge and mindsets that you cannot Google, right? That is sort of the essence of what we're doing. The non-Googleable knowledge and the non-Googleable uh, sort of, sort of uh, 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 mindsets to life. I like so that. So very much, uh, sort of, this is a, a, a renaissance for a classical uh, educational ideal or, or a building But it's powered ideal. by technology. That's right. interesting. Right. That's interesting. So, Roberto, did, did no, you I have wanted a... wanted to, to connect to this and, and maybe picture a different scenario. I, I don't know if those would be the kind of university will survive. Actually, my feeling is that there is a, such a huge demand for the download university, the Google style. Mm -hmm. My feeling that ninety percent of university will be like that because there is a hunger, you know, really from the belly of and uh, you know, mm -hmm. use knowledge, use uh, download knowledge, use it, download knowledge, use it. So, so the choice of be different a and and being more focused on, for example, <laughs> on being free, mm -hmm. it would be a quite a bold choice because in reality the big bulk of the education market will be in another place. It will be a strong choice for the universities and for those who choose to do to go there or it, 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 it's i think you're so right because it this really points to the to the necessity 
of for each educational institution to really try to understand what is it that we're doing? What does our model look like? And that has not been the case because in the old days, you just, you know, we give lectures, we gather students, we give them exams, they're out. Basically, that's the model. Uh, but you really have to rethink now. So what is it that we're doing? What is it that we're providing? How do we use technology? Uh, and how do we use our physical premises in order to create what it is that we want to create? Great. So if, if anyone in the audience uh, had any um, um, uncertainties around what happens if you bring a bunch of academics <laughs> together, <laughs> this is what happens. Uh, but. Um, I, I, just a quick comment and then I'll, I'll broaden the topic a little bit. So I think maybe it's both, right? Maybe the demand for uh, on-demand instant learning to solve problems is skyrocketing, right? Because, you know, even surgeons check YouTube to remind themselves how to, how to perform surgery, right? So that is probably one part of the of the what what is happening, and the other part can still be this this idea of our capability to deal with uncertainty and ambiguity and to be sort of lifelong learners. But we have an audience question here that that is directly focused on the lifelong learning aspects, um, and, and the question is, you know, there is also a very strong theme now about upskilling and reskilling, and that that is the key to driving digital transformation without uh, making a lot of the current workforce obsolete. And, and the question is, you know, will that work? Or will we be able, will companies be able, or will society be able to conduct the necessary reskilling and upskilling in a way that, that uh, uh, avoids that a lot of people might find themselves out of a job because their traditional skills are not, lo not no longer needed in the same way. So uh, this does connect to labor platforms. So maybe I'll start with you, uh, Annabelle. And then um, yes, and this is a priority. I know at the European Commission to to uh, to try to fund programs about uh, about reskilling. Um, but there is always a risk, right? Every time you have a technological transformation, yes. um, there are people who are being left behind. So I think this is a political uh, decision that requires funding and that also requires creative ways by which universities, industry partners and uh, associations in civil society can, can work together. So I think there is a lot of innovation that has to be done in that regard. I cannot be completely sure that uh, it's going to work out this time, but it's certainly on the agenda of a lot of decision makers. Mm. Great, thank you, Annabelle. And and Sarah, what what are your thoughts on this? And you know, is there also a different skill set that needs to be developed in order to drive these cross sectoral aspects? I think there are, and I, I think as well, and I think about the relationships between the large organisations and the small organisations and how they can come together. Mm -hmm. And I know that, uh, from what I understand, large organisations often find it difficult to work with the smaller organisations in terms of they make a relationship with one individual and then that individual moves on and then they have to start again. So I think it's about understanding, bringing the parties together as well to understand each other's own space more right. and how they can work together. So that really, what we're also talking about here is really an increase in the knowledge mm. needed to manage effectively. Yeah. And maybe that social learning space as well. Yeah. yeah. Very, very interesting. And um, I think we're moving in a direction where we'll, we will still be in business. <laughs> that's <laughs> usually what, wh where you end up. I think that's where you and Asamason from Electrolux ended up earlier today as well, that Electrolux will still be in business. It would be quite tragic if on a Friday afternoon <laughs> we ended that <laughs> it's all over. <laughs> I'm happy to hear. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So uh, o discussions and knowledge needs to be contextualized and the Friday afternoon plays a, a, a role here. Speaking of Friday afternoon, we're actually moving towards the end of the program. I'm going to open up if there's anyone who feels that there is a key thing we haven't really stressed in this closing conversation. So uh, if anyone has a, you know, um, a message to us or to the audience or a combination thereof, uh, 
you have and a... I would like to congratulate you, uh, Magnus, for, you know, and colleagues for the organization of this event. I think it's very creative. I think you've brought together people from different horizons, both from academia, from the world of art, uh, from higher education, different, uh, uh, different parts of society. And I think that uh, matches uh, very well the objective and the theme of the conference, which is about hybridization and cross-fertilization across silos. And you've even managed to do a really good blending of, uh, of uh, digital, uh, you know, beaming through and physical right. presence. So I think uh, this is super encouraging and, and exciting, and I want to congratulate you for that. That's Thank a Friday much. afternoon ending. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Annabelle. That's a Friday afternoon ending. <laughs> <laughs> so um, very generous of you, and it's been a pleasure to have you here, and it's been a pleasure to Thanks. have all of you here. Uh, and with that, I'm uh, handing over to Katarina for some closing remarks. So, dear participants, uh, as you just heard, we have reached the end of a fantastic and very exciting day. Um, at the SSC, we educate, we research, but it is also our job to bring people together, just as Annabelle Gower just said. Uh, we like to be an arena where different horizons meet, and we hope that, that ex that's exactly what we've been able to give you today. But there are some thank yous that are in place. So first of all, I'd like to thank you for participating, for being with us, for uh, logging in and staying online. I'd also like to thank our supporters, especially the Wallenberg Foundations, the Erling Persson Foundation, the uh, Jakob and Marcus Wallenberg Research Center at the House of Innovation, as well as the Scania Center for Operational Excellence. Um, I would also like to thank the theme, who, the, the team who has actually made this possible. It's uh, Lina, Marie, Emilia, uh, Maria taking all the questions. Uh, without you, this conference would not have happened. And I would, of course, like to thank everyone who has been speaking, sharing their insights, participating in the panels. It's been great to be with you. We look forward to seeing you again long before next year, but if not before, we will be back in October with another Digital Day 2022. Feel free to reach out to the SSC anytime. We are there for you. So thank you and have a lovely weekend. Bye. <laughs>